Um, hi everyone, my name is Amelia. Um, I am a member of the Worth's um, Maternal Health Education Project. I am focusing specifically on doula education, so I'm here with Lily Schaefer today, who's going to tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a doula. Lily, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Lily Schaefer. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a certified birth and postpartum doula. I am also a registered nurse, and I am a nurse midwifery student um, getting my master's of science in nursing. Um, yeah, so I, I currently work as a registered nurse in an independent abortion clinic. Um, prior to going to nursing school, I had a doula, full spectrum doula practice in Boston. Um, I did that for about three years where I worked as a birth and postpartum doula um, and have an end goal of becoming a nurse midwife. And that's what I'm in school for right now. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so we're going to jump right into some questions. So first off, just some of the basics. What exactly is a doula? What do what does a doula do before labor, during labor, and after labor? What what does that look like? Yeah. So there's um, there's kind of there's a couple of different kinds of doulas. So there's birth doulas, there's postpartum doulas, there's doulas that focus on um, pregnancy loss, bereavement doulas, or abortion support. Um, so I think of a doula as a non-medical provider who offers physical, emotional, and informational support during the prenatal period, the postpartum period, um, and the intrapartum, so like the labor period. Um, so we're not medical professionals. Um, as a doula, ideally, you understand birth, and you understand physiological birth, and you understand everything from signs of labor um, to being able to help educate people on what kinds of pain management is available during labor, whether that's um, like pharmacological pain management or whether that's um, non-pharmacological. Um, you are kind of educated and in the whole process and in the postpartum period. So the healing period for the birthing person, family dynamics, um, breast or chest feeding support, um, or just like infant feeding in general, kind of all of that. Um, but your, your focus, rather than being um, a midwife or an OBGYN or a nurse, your focus is really on the individual. So you have the opportunity to get to know a birthing individual and their family or their partner if they have one, um, you get to know like what are their goals for labor, what are their hopes, what is their ideal birth plan, what are their fears, what kind of past traumas are they bringing into this pregnancy and delivery, um, and you can advocate for that person. You don't speak for that person, but you remind them if they're kind of moving away from their original um, goals or plans, you can um, provide kind of act as a liaison between medical providers who are taking care of multiple patients at once, um, who have kind of complicated, um, you know, they're, they're, they have to follow protocol and policy and they also want what's best for the person and they also might be ending a shift and have dinner plans at six o'clock that they're trying to get to. Um, but a doula is with you the whole time. So if you give birth in anywhere but your home, chances are you're going to have healthcare providers that are on eight or 12 hour shifts. And at that shift change, you're going to have a change of person, a new stranger who you've never met before, who's in one of the most intimate um, times of your life. So the doula kind of aims to fill a gap within um, the healthcare system that we exist in, um, both during that intrapartum period, and then again, postpartum providing the support that historically one might have if you have siblings, um, you know, traditionally sisters or mothers, but it could be any any family member of any gender. Um, we live in a very kind of fractured society where you don't live with your siblings and your parents and they might not be down the road. Um, so kind of helping to create uh, that support in the postpartum period. And then, yeah. Um, and then obviously like a, a bereavement doula or um, an abortion doula is kind of doing those same things, knowing the individual, but helping them through um, a different choice within pregnancy. Absolutely. Um, so I know you touched on this a little bit, but can you go through some of the benefits of having a doula, both for the birthing person and for the infant? Yeah. Um, so we know that doulas are Amazing. There's, um, you know, this is anecdotal, but there's also a lot of evidence that shows that having a birth doula increases the satisfaction that one has in their birth experience. It um, lowers the risk of interventions such as epidurals and C-sections and um, things that are sometimes necessary and useful tools in labor, but things that we also know are very, very um, highly 
um, overused in our in our healthcare system in the U.S. Um, they can offer, like I said, that continuous care, hands-on support, emotional support, um, coping interventions. So they they there's some quote somewhere I remember seeing about um, how if if having a doula was like a drug, it would be like against it would be against standard of practice to offer one. Um, so it's it's like everybody should have everybody deserves one right we're not just here to support unmedicated birth or home birth like we're here to support the the person who is pregnant and like what their goals are and to see them as a unique individual and try our best to um help them through a process that is transformative and full of celebration and full of grief and can bring up heaps of trauma for people, some that they didn't even know that they'd had, um, and to kind of be there alongside them to provide that physical, emotional, informational support. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, yeah, and kind of moving on to the next um, kind of topic a little bit. I know you talked about this, but can you go through some of the types of doulas again yeah. and highlight um, what each type of doula does and what their focus is? Um, and maybe some specific techniques or um, skills that those types of doulas would have over um, like an abortion doula versus a birth doula. Totally. Yeah. Um, so full disclosure, uh, in my practice in, in Boston, I worked as a birth and postpartum doula. And I did work with people who were experiencing loss or who had experienced loss, uh, but I never worked as an abortion doula per se. Um, so I can speak about that from like my experience as an abortion nurse now um, and from what I know what they do. But effectively, when you go to um, a somewhere to have an abortion, um, or when you take a medication abortion, which is a set of two pills that you would um, take in the second set of pills you would take at home, um, and then you would basically be inducing a miscarriage. This can happen during up until 11 weeks of pregnancy. Um, and you can order, there. there's an increase in um, people who are choosing to purchase those pills online. Um, so a lot of people are not seeing a medical provider previously. And of course, we would recommend that you do this under the care of a medical provider um, and with those resources. And also some people don't have access to that because of laws, because of um, safety reasons. Um, so some people would choose to hire an abortion doula for that as well, to be with them during the process while at home to explain, this is the normal amount of cramping. This is a normal amount of bleeding. These are things I'm doing to provide you with pain management. Um, or it can be somebody if they're having a surgical procedure who um, is with them in the clinic. Um, some clinics do, especially pre-COVID, offer support, hands-on support, um, you know, somebody to hold your hand, especially if it's um, an, uh, an abortion that's taking place without um, anesthesia and you're awake for it. Um, it's, it's not an easy decision for a lot of people emotionally, and for some people it totally is. And it is a um, not a comfortable procedure for many people as well. Um, so a doula can offer both that in-person, right? You might have a nurse or a provider who is very focused on you and your your physical well-being and ensuring a safe and successful abortion, um, but might not be able to attend to your emotional needs because of the volume of patients or the time constraints or whatever it is. Um, and some people will also choose to have an abortion doula if there's nobody that they feel safe talking to or nobody in their life that they can kind of share that with. Um, a birth doula. So the way I um, I kind of structured my practice as if somebody, you know, contacts me, we would meet, we would see if we're a good fit. They'd talk to me a little bit about themselves and their family. And I'd talk to them about, um, you know, kind of my beliefs and my values and how my practice works. And then if you decide we're a good fit and I decide we're a good fit and we choose to work together, then we would have two prenatals. And those prenatals, the first was really focused on like, who are you? How do you cope with pain? What are your goals? How do you cope with exhaustion? How does your partner cope with exhaustion? What are things that you might do? Maybe it's like picking at your fingernails or pacing or like becoming really chatty that are a signifier that you're anxious or afraid or exhausted. Um, what are? How do you intend to work together? What are your expectations of me? What are your expectations of each other? Would you like to catch your baby? Would you like to... Um, 
cut the cord? Are you like, I don't want to see any blood. I'm going to pass out if that happens. Like it's so different for everybody. And to be in somebody's home to, to kind of be able to see them in their own environment, to meet their pets or their other children, to know like where they're going um, afterwards. Um, it was a really important part of that as well. And then the second one was more hands-on. So like, what are different positions we can try? What is a rebozo? Um, what is the history of a rebozo? Um, what is a double hip squeeze? What um, essential oils do you think smell really good versus like make you very nauseous? Um, and we kind of go through like a whole birth bag and try all these things and say, you know, does this massage technique work for you? Does this one not feel good? Um, and get a sense of like, what are some of these tools that we can pull out? Um, I would also try to talk to people about um, the, you know, what are some decisions that might need to be made? So if somebody brings up the idea of an epidural or um, the idea of an external version to turn a breech baby or these things that they're not a complete surprise. Um, so providing that education that you simply cannot get within this medical system when you are, you know, 10 to 15 minutes to see a healthcare provider in a practice of 10 people and you have no idea who's going to be there when the time comes. Um, and then it's just on-call support. So somebody could call me if they think they're in labor, they're not sure. Um, someone could call me because they are in the middle of an induction and they have important decisions to make, um, or they've just left a, a practice and they've, they have hypertension and they're trying to wrap their heads around like what medical interventions might, aren't, might become necessary now. Um, and then I would be there the entire birth, stay for a couple of hours postpartum, ensure that they've transitioned well, um, whether that's in their home or into the postpartum unit at a hospital. Um, and then I remain, we do a follow-up visit to usually two weeks later to kind of assess emotional well-being, breastfeeding or chest feeding or bottle feeding, whatever, however the parents are feeding the baby, um, to kind of talk about the birth experience, get feedback, think about like, are there, are there things that they want clarity on, um, go through the timeline because a lot of people don't remember everything. Um, and then postpartum, it's 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 just that you're there in the postpartum period, and that might look like baby wearing education, sleeping education. It might look like me wearing baby and cooking and folding the laundry so that mom and dad can, or mom and mom, or whoever the family makeup is, can um, go sleep for three hours. Um, it could look like breastfeeding or chest feeding support. Um, all kind of a whole gamut of different things that are really tailored to what does this family need at this time. Um, and really seeing them through the first, the postpartum period, which is traditionally the first three months after birth. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the different types, how exactly does one become a doula? What training is involved? Mm -hmm. What types of people make good doulas? Um, what I think, like, even for you personally, what were the most um, surprising or impactful things that you learned during your doula training? Yeah, that was a really long time ago. <laughs> I did my doula training a long time ago. Um, so, so there's there's different there's pre there's birth doula training, there's postpartum doula trainings, there's bereavement doula trainings, and abortion doula trainings. There's death doula trainings. Death doula is a thing now. I don't really know that much about it, um, but that exists. Um, yeah. So. So I did like a, it was like a three day birth doula training. And then there was a childbirth education, education course that I had to complete with that as well. Um, there was like X amount of um, books that I had to read and like essays. Um, I trained through Dona International, which is like one of the original um, doula trainings. And for me, like not knowing really that much about birth at the time, like I knew some, but, and I knew that I, I knew at this point I thought I wanted to be a midwife, but I didn't like I hadn't been to a birth before. Um, so it, it's really beneficial to get that to understand like what are the stages of labor? What does it mean when the midwife says, "Oh, you're um, eighty percent and eight centimeters and like zero station," and I'm guessing that you're going through transition right now? Um, how do you convey that to a person that's like? in, you know, has no idea what's going on or, um, yeah, is, is kind of out of having an out of body experience because of the changes that are happening in their body at that point. Um, so, 
I did that. And then you do like X amount of births, depends on the certifying organization. Um, and then like the provider, the nurse, the family all have to write a review about you. And then you can like send in your application to become certified. Many people don't become certified. I never became certified as a postpartum doula because there's like politics and like, right, there's a lot that can be, we could have a whole other conversation about what it means to like legislate and certify. Um, but those trainings are really helpful to also understand like what is normal, what is not, like what is it, what are these signs if you're laboring with somebody that's happening really, really quickly, right? Um, what does it mean? How do you educate on certain things? Um, what is a cord prolapse? What if you're home in the early stages of labor with somebody and their their water breaks and this cord falls out? Like what like what do you do and how do you get them appropriate help? What does a business strategy look like? Um, like what does partnerships with another doula look like? So there's a lot of different things like that. Um, and there's so many different types of training organizations. Um, you know, individual doulas can become trained to then train. You can go through a big organization. Um, I trained through like a very generic vanilla, like very much geared towards straight cis white families um, as a birth doula. And I think at the time, like I wanted a very, I wanted just that. I wanted a very basic, straightforward. And then I chose as a, in, a, in my postpartum doula training to train with like a queer home birth midwife and to do something that was much, much, much different mm -hmm. um, because I wanted something that like respected the traditions of um, like postpartum belly binding ceremonies and rebozo work. Uh, we had a family come in that was like, um, like not a you know traditional family, and that there were three parents involved. Um, and they, like that was something that was very like normal to me, but was not to a lot of the people who I did that training with. Um, I wanted things to kind of be shaken up a little bit and to learn how to better care for people that are not represented in standard um, trainings. So. I think that that is really an important element of picking a training for people who are um, considering this, these types of trainings. Um, does that answer the, the training question? No, really. no, yeah, I just wanted to hear about your experience. I think, yeah, I think that's such an important point too yeah, about getting um, information and training that does support such a wide variety of birth mm -hmm. families and situations mm -hmm. because I'm sure, you know, you've never seen two exact situations mm -hmm. and alike in your training and you have to kind of be prepared for anything right as a, you know as a birth doula right definitely yeah yeah absolutely um so the last topic that i wanted to touch on was um like affording and accessing doula care yeah um, so <laughs> <laughs> how much does it typically cost to hire a doula and how can people um access that or afford it if um, that's a challenge to them. I know you have done a lot yeah. of your doula work. Um, and I was wondering if you talk a little bit about yeah. that, a little bit about what the process of hiring a doula looks mm -hmm. like. That's a really good question. And it doesn't have a simple answer. Um, <laughs> like you and I both know this and I'll say it though, in case people, um, who, you know, aren't aware of this. Um, but like our, our healthcare system is totally messed up. Um, and it does not support things that, are like like having a doula makes so much sense and there is so much evidence and it should just be generally covered by all insurance which includes federally funded insurance but it is not for so many reasons um and i think there's a lot of different things you can do so first of all like some people can pay out of pocket for a doula right and that's fantastic um and some people will choose to pay extra so that they can then pay it forward, right? And then that person can, um, effectively the doula can then provide services but still get paid for their expertise. Mm -hmm. And there's a really fine line between like offering free services and then valuing people's expertise and education and their time. Okay. Um, I had births. I had one birth. I was there for 52 hours. Um, like you have times when you are like, you're there and I, I would, you, you know, you say bye to your partner, you say bye to your plans, you miss holidays, you miss birthday parties and you're like, I don't know when I'll be back. Um, so I think that, I, I guess that's like, that's a different question. Okay, coming back to this. So, 
Um, so I would often get contacted, especially early on, by childbirth educators, um, nurses, midwives, and it would be for a family who is looking for a low cost doula. You know, they can pay, they say their limit is $150 or $200. And very often you can find new to practice doulas who are willing to take low cost or volunteer births. Doesn't mean they're not gonna be wonderful. Um, doesn't mean that they don't have the adequate training. They might be looking for births that are they're certifying births and you will agree to write them a recommendation or give them an evaluation in exchange for their services. So that's one way. There's a lot of doula um, support volunteer programs. Um, so I volunteered with one through Mass General Hospital that was specifically for, they were, you know, it was quote, at risk moms, which typically meant um, non-English speaking moms, um, people who were immigrants, people who didn't have additional support there. Um, and that for me was really important because like as a Spanish speaker who didn't have a pretty robust um, Spanish obstetric uh, vocabulary, I really wanted to be attending births in Spanish. And I also um, really wanted to be helping and ensuring that people who couldn't pay for doula support but needed doula support could get it. So there's volunteers. Um, another thing that I did and I would encourage people to do if they're looking for um, either a lower cost doula or a more affordable doula is to find somebody who works on a sliding scale. Um, and for me, that sliding scale looked like far below what I needed in order to pay my rent and far above what I needed. And when I first started that, I thought there's absolutely no way anybody is ever going to pay me the top of my range. And what I very quickly realized was that the people who could did, and they had absolutely no problem doing that because they understood that it meant I could help the young single teenage parent. Um, it meant I could help folks that you know didn't have support here or didn't have the finances for it. Um, and it it just makes it more accessible. And I always like, I had a disclosure in my, on my website, I had a disclosure in my contract that said, you know, like if this, if this fee is a problem for you, like we will work it out. We'll figure something out. And I, I bartered with people sometimes, maybe they had something farming, they, they were farmers and had food that they were able to offer or furniture that they were making, uh, but they didn't have like the cash. Um, so there's kind of, there are lots of doulas that are open to that. Um, there are lots of doulas that are open to payment plans. Um, and there are lots of doulas that are willing to do the sliding scale to ensure that their um, services are affordable and accessible. Um, there, I am very confident that anybody who wants a doula can find somebody who is within their um affordability range and that again that might be somebody who's new and that's okay that doesn't mean that they're not like fully equipped to um be a wonderful support person um, yeah um and then kind of just one more question under yeah. around you know accessible care how do you mm -hmm. um practice trauma-informed care i know you mentioned that earlier about you know kind of working through um anxieties and traumas yeah the birth what what techniques do you use to kind of um, navigate that? Yeah, yeah. That's a really good question. It's really tough. Um, I So I think there's a lot of different elements to trauma-informed care. One is um, the language that you choose to use. And I think about that as um, right now, like as I'm doing pelvic exams on people, right? Like how do you do a trauma-informed pelvic exam? Um, how do you talk to people in a way um, that is affirming of their gender identity if they're existing in a system and in a world that is highly, highly, highly gendered? Um, so things like changing your language from the mother to the birther or from breastfeeding to breastfeeding or chest feeding, um, right? Like changing from like the laboring woman to the birthing person, right? So it's changing your language to start including more people. Um, that's thing A. Thing B, I think I think it's important to ask questions, to um, thank people for feeling comfortable with sharing information with you, and for asking if 
if they want to talk about this more so that the person is always so right if somebody says to me like yes I have a history of being sexually assaulted and I am thinking about how this might impact my experience in labor um saying to them like you know it is talking about this something that you're comfortable with like Mm -hmm. no not right now if at some point you do feel comfortable I want you to know that like you are safe here you are um respected here um Right. So thinking a lot about language, thinking about um, advocating for your your client. So one thing I always tell people is that I'm not going to make decisions for them. I'm not going to talk to their provider on their behalf, but I am going to make sure that they have the information they need to ask the questions they might not know to ask. So if a provider comes in and says, I'm going to check your cervix now to say to the patient or the client, you know, um, it sounds like they want to check your cervix to see how dilated you are. Do you want to know why this is important right now? Would you rather wait a little bit? What are you feeling? Um, or if, if, you know, this decision has to be made about something to say like, what do you think? Do you want to talk about it in private right now? And then the person can be like, oh yeah, do I have to make this decision right now or can we can we wait? Could you step out so we could have some privacy and could you come back in 10 minutes? Um, the one time I throw that out the window is if somebody attempts to touch a patient or put their hands inside of a patient without their consent. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is the times when I would say, I don't know if you're hearing what she's saying, but she's telling you that she's not ready or she's telling you she's having a contraction or they're telling you that they actually aren't interested in having a cervical check at all right now. Um, and in kind of ensuring that like we're acting as um we're acting as advocates for the birthing person, for the family, and that we're at sometimes protecting them um, because we know that there is a large history of um, like medical rape and of medical sexual assault um, and medical trauma. And then at other times I would tell people, you know, sometimes even if people said that they had no history, I think when you exist, Um, either as a woman or as a queer person um, or as a person of color or really as anybody except for like a cis white man in this world, like you have trauma. (laughs) There's no, like we all have it. Um, And sometimes I would say to people, you know, who, who wouldn't share anything, sometimes things come up in birth. Sometimes you have no, you know, or they come up in, in new parenthood. And you might not even be aware of it. You might things could have happened, before, you know, as as a small child. And if things do come up, like know that I will be there to protect you, to listen to you, to advocate for you, um, whatever it is. Um, those are the first things that come to mind. Um, if people are interested in more, uh, there's a pretty good book called When Survivors Give Birth um, that is about sexual assault and um, trauma-informed care as a doula. Stephanie Tillman is a nurse midwife. She writes a blog called The Feminist Midwife. Um, you can follow her on Instagram. You can follow her newsletter. Um, and she just actually pu- published something recently in um, the oh my God, Journal of Midwifery about pelvic trauma-informed pelvic care uh, I think that like going out there looking at her blog and and, and doing some reading about um, the language the practices all that um, is a really important part of of being a doula if this is something you're interested in yeah absolutely awesome well, I think yeah. that's all the questions I have for you right now do you have anything okay. else you want to add or throw in kind of at the end here yeah doulas are great <laughs> Um, if people have any like questions about doula work, abortion work, um, midwifery, I like I'm always happy to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I really do. The doulas have really increased in popularity, I think, over the last five, eight years. Um, and I think that anybody, regardless of your birth plan, regardless of your postpartum plan um, or your family structure, can benefit from a doula. Um, so. Hopefully someday soon they're just going to be like a normal part of everybody's birth experience and postpartum yeah, experience. Totally. That'd be awesome. All right. Well, thank you again, Lily. Yeah. Thanks for having me.